Hello and welcome everyone to our new lecture in the IIRE series on the changing shapes of imperialism today. So today we will have two speakers on to the topic of Ukraine and the anti-imperialist left. Um, our first speaker is Catherine Samary. Catherine is an economist and a socialist activist based in France, a member of the Fourth International and author of a great many articles and books on the evolution of the so-called socialist countries in the East of Europe. Recently, she published a book titled Decolonial Communism, Democracy and the Commons. The book was published in cooperation with the IIRE. She also has a website, the link to which you can find on the IIRE website, where you can also find more information on our other publications. Our other speaker is Hanna Perachoda, born and raised in Donetsk, Ukraine. Anna is a PhD candidate in history at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland and a member of the Swiss-based Committee of Solidarity with the Ukrainian people and with the Russian opposition to the war. Both of our speakers are also active in the European Network for Solidarity with Ukraine. And again, in the announcement on the IIRE website, you can find a link to the website of this network. So our first speaker will be Catherine, who will speak for more or less 20 minutes. After that, Anna will be speaking. While they are speaking, you can enter your questions through the Q&A tool on the bottom of your screen. And after both of our speakers have finished their introduction, there will be some time for questions and answers. We will make a selection of the questions that have been entered during the introductions. But in order not to take any more time, I will now give the word to Catherine. Catherine, go ahead. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, the topics of today is not an abstract, uh, uh, and only and mainly, I would say, conceptual debate. It's uh, really uh, centered on a very concrete war, which is now um, um, having its uh, already anniversary of six months of death and casualties on the very concrete Ukrainian people. So my um, main uh, emphasis here for internationally left will be the absolute need uh, to subordinate and the debate on concept uh, to the concrete analysis of the concrete situation with the eyes of the immediate victims of a very concrete war. Uh, that is, that is I, I would say, both on conceptual dimensions and the political actions, a precondition for real internationalist uh, intervention and understanding. So I will raise, because of very short time and link to the topics, um, two main points. <laughs> uh, I will, um, my, my first point is uh, Russian imperialists do exist. The second will be Ukraine nation population and resistance do exist. And for both points, of course, I will uh, try to uh, underline the open uh, questions and international open uh, context in which uh, this aggressive war is occurring and which obliges us uh, as Marxists or um, simply uh, people concerned and involved in solidarity activity against victims of oppression to update uh, the concepts, the understanding of what is the world, I would say disaster 
uh, the world disorder um, behind the uh, imperialist um, conflicting order. So my point, the first point is uh, what I said before, uh, imperialist Russian do exist, of course, um, tomorrow the comrade will intervene on that, will develop that. So it's very synthetic approach that I want to, to, to defend um, within a context. The context, I'm not uh, here speaking as an historian, I am not such an historian. And even more, as I said, we have to deal with a, a concrete context. I will limit the significant, a very immediate significant context, I would say to a double turn in the world system. Uh, for um, the first one was at the end of the 60s, 70s, the so-called neoliberal uh, turn uh, presented as, uh, uh, as such under this vocabulary, which, is, which has more to do with counter-revolutionary turn on many respects, um, which occurred at the end of the 70s and beginning of the 80s, and it's still ongoing with different phases, but I will not do deal with this. You had also a, a debate on that in the first day. Um, but the second uh, turn, which is often um, underestimated or even not at all analyzed by um, international, uh, even Marxist leftists and anti-imperialist currents, is 1989-91 uh, uh, historical turn which puts an end to what has been called the short 20th century, or like uh, Moshe Levin uh, called it also in another sense, uh, the Soviet century. But that is which occurred between the first uh, October revolution and the end of Soviet Union. And in between a uh, huge transformation of relationship of force, anti-capitalist, anti-colonial war, and new revolutions. And a transformation also within this context, anti-imperialist and uh, anti-colonial uh, resistance, also the transformation of the revolutions themselves, bureaucratization, Stalinization of Soviet Union. And so, the end of that phase is very complex, both for concepts and for concrete reality. And I'm, I must concentrate on Russia, but of course, um, it's a broader question, which you have discussed about China probably yesterday, um, but uh, which should be uh, analyzed in more detail in different phases. I only synthesize my I would say, um, approach about Russia, uh, that is post-Soviet Union uh, Russia, um, and the phase between so 99 and today. Uh, and I would only say briefly that, in fact, we must distinguish two, uh, the two decades. I mean, Yeltsin first part, uh, first um, kind of power, uh, and th that is in the 90s, and then the, the years uh, after the turn of the end of the 90s, 2000 up to now, which is Putin's era. But it's not on, uh, simply a problem of persons, but of if we qualify the position uh, of uh, Russia in the world system, and the capitalist transformation of Russia, the kind of capitalist transformation of, of Russia, even if I cannot go into the detail, I have written articles on that, but I would say in a synthetic way uh, that, that I, I would oppose in a synthetic way an interpretation which is often dominant, which presents Russia transformation, Russian transformation as um, an humiliation uh, for the uh, ongoing uh, people, powers uh, taken as, as a whole, and um, uh, which presents the whole period as a confrontation between Russia and uh, the um, NATO 
uh, uh, US-led NATO, uh, which was maintained uh, after the German unification and after the, dissol the, the dissolution of the Va Warsaw Pact in 91 with the dissolution of Soviet Union. Uh, and um, so the, the, the dominant uh, narrative on the left is to present uh, Russian situation as a victim of uh, NATO's expansion and of an external kind of aggression. I disagree with this kind of narrative and analysis. It doesn't correspond to the reality. I would simply say, to be short, uh, first that uh, the historical turns meant uh, I mean, in uh, Russia, like in, in China, by the way, and uh, in other countries, even Cuba, for political, socio-economical choices, nothing fatal, and choices made by the, on, uh, those who were leading forces and political uh, actors, and uh, in the position to decide how to transform ownership and who did decide uh, um, uh, to transform ownership, not simply under the pressure of a school of thought, which did exist, of course, at the international level, neoliberal uh, kind of school um, pushing towards systematic privatization. But there was a choice of privatization of the dominant part of the nomenclatura, including precisely Yeltsin, Putin, and so on, for themselves, transforming the advantage of power at the head of the single, uh, uh, single party system into a privilege of ownership or in different phase. Now the first phase for Russia, different from China, I, don't, I cannot, of course, push uh, forward the, the comparison. So I'm concentrating on, on Russia and uh, the first decade was a dis industrial destruction dominated by oligarch and privatization of the states. And I would qualify, characterize, I would say Yeltsin as the comprador bourgeois. That is with an alliance, uh, organic even alliance with international imperialist powers and the relationship to NATO not being in uh, opposition but in partnership. And the war launched by uh, Yeltsin and later on by Putin against Chechnya in Russia, which was a terrible, aggressive war, um, a criminal war, was completely supported by Western imperialist uh, countries, NATO, behind the NATO, um, maintained by the US. Uh, I would say briefly also that I consider, uh, without developing uh, the, the thesis, the, the fact that NATO was maintained in 1989-81, not as an anti-Russian issue, but an anti-German issue for United States and UK. Uh, while uh, those uh, powers wanted to control the unified Germany through NATO, Mitterrand in France wished to control the unified Germany through a new monetary system and building European Union at the very time in uh, asking the, the German powers to get rid of the Deutschmark. And that was the issue, not Russia. And second, later on, or again, very briefly, I am a specialist on the, the, the study of uh, the former Yugoslavia, its crisis and dismantlement and so on. The first NATO war uh, in the de facto NATO war in, uh, in, against Yugoslavia, against Milosevic and so on, I would say it was not an anti-Russian uh, decision again. It was a, a decision by the US to try and control the unit, the, the, the European Union, which was in the process of being built uh, in conflicting relationship with United uh, States. And uh, uh, there was the, 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 uh, the will to use the crisis of the Yugoslav crisis to legitimate a new role of NATO 
and in increasing expansion of NATO in Eastern Europe in order to try and uh, dismantle the kind of political project, socio-economical project of the European Union, which I identify as a bourgeois project, but not a US project. Huh? So, so to, to finish on that point, then the, the years 2000 were years of conflicts, of course, between Russia and uh, the uh, US and uh, in a way with NATO partially, but not the, the central issue was not NATO. The central issue for Putin was uh, to rebuild what has been destroyed in the 90s, that is a strong state, both internally and internationally, uh, for its own privilege and power, uh, controlling the oligarch instead of being controlled by the oligarchs. Uh, so I don't develop that point. Uh, it has international uh, consequences, Modern modernization of the military indus industry as a key point of uh, um, uh, rebuilding the strong power. And to, to go uh, quickly to the end of the period, I would say that um, between I would say the last period of Putin's uh, role before the ongoing war, that is um, between the Maidan uh, period uh, in, in 2014, the Crimea and Donbass uh, beginning of the war in a way. And uh, today um, was uh, Russia under the threat of NATO and was uh, uh, the uh, ongoing war launched in 2022, an answer, reactive answer to a threat against Russia? I said, no, not at all. First, I would say that the main concern, uh, the main concern for Putin was so-called colored revolution. That is the identification of all upsurge, social upsurge against corruption and autocratic powers as an uh, instrument of uh, foreign powers and of Western powers and of NATO, but de facto as a threat for its own power in Russia. Second, the fact that the uh, unforeseen collapse of uh, Yanushenko and, of, uh, and the possibility to um, annex uh, Crimea and take control on Donbass uh, was an attempt to first consolidate its popularity, internal popularity as a strong uh, state, but also with uh, international and nationalist dimension in, in Russia. Uh, but also um, it was a, a mean to uh, well, give alternative, <laughs> uh, alternative um, uh, feelings to the people against social economic uh, important uh, issues. And uh, just before uh, the, exist, the, 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 the war launched in 2022, uh, in fact, in Belarus and Kazakhstan, uh, the Russian power could consolidate, that it put, Putin could consolidate both its uh, relationship with Lukashenko in Belarus, and, uh, uh, and it could also push forward the, the use of the uh, small NATO kind of uh, treaty which existed with autocratic powers in Kazakhstan and in the region, again, social movement last year's also there. And um, uh, Putin uh, thought before the, the launching of his war that not NATO, that NATO was not at all uh, in, in the position to aggress it, but on the contrary, that NATO was in big crisis big crisis after Afghanistan, big crisis of conflicts between U United States and European countries, and within United uh, European countries, big conflicts on gas, big conflict on, on, on uh, political orientation with Russia and so on. So I finish this point. Um, there was not a reactive war, but an offensive war based on an, uh, uh, Putin's evaluation of relationship of force, both uh, regionally and internationally. Second, 
uh, the narrative of that war uh, was explicitly against Ukraine independent state and nation. And that's my second point, rapidly. Um, um, Putin's um, um, narrative used not as a main argument to NATO issues. It used as a main argument the fact that Soviet Union had been built uh, on the base of a destruction of Russian, great Russian unity in Belarus, Ukraine and Russia. And that the recognition by Lenin of uh, Ukraine, Be Belarus, uh, self-determination was a deep error that Stalin, according to Putin, could uh, get rid of in a way of building a strong and unified Soviet Union. Uh, so Putin's war uh, prolonged what had been also Stalin's aggression against Ukraine during the Soviet Union against the kind of orientation uh, 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 pushed forward by, by Lenin, who, who, who claimed, and that's still a stake for us as anti-imperialist and leftist, he claimed the idea that you cannot build an anti-capitalist, socialist, communist union um, through forced relationship without recognition of the different nation people. And there I make some remarks about the question of self-determination, nation, people. Of course, um, Ukraine, like France, like any country of the world, like any society, is a conflicting historical reality. Uh, fragile, and the definition of who is citizen within Ukraine is an open question, like in France. Uh, where you have, of course, far-right people who would like that France belong only to real so-called French, uh, which is a xenophobia, a xenophobic, racist, of course, approach of citizenship and, and nation. And you have the same issue in Ukraine. Um, you have also an open issue which the Ukrainian people, citizen, political currents will have to deal with, like the French have to deal with their own past uh, Algerian war, by the way, who was never called a war before a recent period. Uh, Ukrainian citizen will have to deal with their black, the back, the black pages of their history in the conflicting approach. And there is a huge Marxist tradition, uh, in particular, Roman Rozdarsky in Ukraine against Engels approach of uh, national so-called non-historical people, Slavish in particular. And um, uh, so, and you have an open question, I said it in the beginning, for Marxist and progressive people to uh, um, update how in the anti-capitalist, socialist, communist understanding of unions of oppressed people, you articulate intersectionality that is what is said today. You articulate class, gender, national issues at different territorial level. And you build a union on the base, not of a statist approach of the nation, not on the far right kind of definition of a racist definition of the nation, but on popular mobilization. I must finish. Um, uh, in the last minutes, I want to say that we have a chance, we, the left, have a chance that um, a real existing, um, a new uh, young left ex um, in Ukraine is combining both uh, um, the fight inside the broad popular national front of resistance uh, against a war of aggression which has neocolonial, imperial, and imperialist dimensions with wars within the war. Uh, that is the idea that self-determination and the building of a Ukrainian people, nation, and future is depending upon who is, will decide, who will decide upon 
peace, who will decide upon the conditions of rebuilding Ukraine, who will decide upon the kind of society you build, and so on. And our, and I finish on that, our uh, uh, left uh, network in which Hannah and myself are involved has his main uh, orientation, first of all, to be linked and to give voice to the left Ukrainian trade unionist feminist political forces, which are fighting against reactionary laws against workers on the base of the fact that only the mobilization of workers, of feminists, of women, of all parts of Ukraine can consolidate and is in the process of consolidating a Ukrainian society, Ukrainian nation, Ukrainian people, which would be part of the rebuilding of a decolonized, uh, decolonized concept of the continent, of European Union and of the world. And that is our task in relationship with the pacifist Russian uh, citizens fighting against that aggressive war. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. So now we go to our second speaker, Hanna Perakhoda. Uh, Hanna, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me and Catherine. Um, I share the analysis uh, she presented. And I must say sorry in advance for the fact that I'm outside. It may be noisy here. So if you don't hear me, uh, you can maybe make a sign, um, so I will try to improve the situation, but I'm on a trip, uh, so unfortunately uh, <laughs> I must <clears throat> be in such, in such conditions. Okay, so I will try not to be very long and I will give a brief uh, presentation about the national and uh, imperial dimension of Russian-Ukrainian relations. Uh, and in my opinion, this uh, dimension is not taken enough into account when we talk about the current war. So, as you know, uh, Ukraine is the second uh, largest uh, country in Europe. It's bigger than France, but it's smaller than Russia. Its population is about uh, 40 million people, but uh, let's be honest, it's a very little known country. It uh, remained in the shadow of Russian historical narrative, and I think it's partly because of our underestimation or simply lack of knowledge about the imperial and national dimension of Russian-Ukrainian relationships that we are now witnesses of, of this horrible war. So, um, yeah, in order to understand the war, we must know that Ukraine always held um, a central place in the Russian uh, uh, imperial and national project. And just before the invasion, uh, Vladimir Putin gave a long speech, which was aimed to justify the so-called special military operation. And it reflected a worldview according to which there is a so-called uh, triple Russian nation that includes Russians, Ukrainians, and uh, Belarusians. Um, so where does this idea comes from, actually? Um, this idea that Ukrainians and Russians are one and the same people um, is a result of a, a specific policy which was de developed by Imperial Russia in the uh, 80s, 90s, 90th century. And one of the objectives of this policy uh, was to constitute uh, to to yeah to create um, a dominant uh, nationality within the empire, which had become very big, very vast in the 19th century, and which now included uh, sorry, which included a huge number of um, non-Slavic and non-Orthodox -Or people, and this triple Russian nation uh, would actually make it possible to form a majority, an orthodox Slav majority uh, within the empire that would exercise its domination over the less loyal and less integrated communities, for example, especially uh, Muslims. 
um, from this point of view, uh, Ukrainians had to become Russians. Uh, that's why the Ukrainian separate identity was and is still uh, perceived by Russian elites as an existential threat uh, to their uh, national project and to their state uh, and its um, destruction uh, of, of, of the Ukrainian uh, separate identity was not only aimed at uh, maintaining the stability of the imperial space as a whole, uh, because the very unity of the Russian nation, the, the core of the empire was at stake. So this um, antagonism between the idea of Russia as an empire, an empire that includes, for example, I don't know, Caucasia, Siberia, Tatarstan, and other no, at no Slavic um, regions, and the idea of Russia as a nation, a nation that includes Russians, Belarusians, and Ukrainians, this, this antagonism was, ha has never been entirely resolved. And the desire actually to combine uh, these two political projects, um, imperial and uh, project of a nation state, uh, was one of the reasons for, for uh, inherent uh, fragi fragility of both the Tsarist Empire and the USSR. One of the aspects, of course. And it seems to me uh, like this contradiction can be, could be, uh, the reason why the Russian state could uh, decompose one more time. Um, Russian imperialism and uh, colonialism didn't enter our like uh, common imagination, uh, even in the academic circles of, or political um, activist cycles, um, because this imagination remains uh, paradoxically very western centered so we are like as western people the descendants of european uh, colonizers we study uh, we have um, we are accustomed to study uh, our uh, western imperial domination over other peoples so we deconstruct the heritage of it and it's very important it's a very yeah very useful uh, we need to do it, but at the same time, we uh, ignore uh, more, yeah, we, we don't pay enough attention to the non-Western empires. And as a, a result, we don't hear um, the voices of those people who were colonized, for example, by Russia. And we tend, uh, especially in the culture and the art artistic spheres, uh, not to consider, not to consider these voices. Um, so, yeah, maybe I could develop more about the, how to say, the um, Ukrainian, um, the construction of Ukrainian national identity, Russian national um, and imperial identity during the 20th century, if it's necessary, during the question, because I don't want to take much time. Uh, now, uh, so Ukraine uh, became independent in the 1991, but uh, Russia, Russian regional domination and uh, and uh, cultural, I don't know, ambitions of superiority, and and its uh, revanchist uh, ambitions uh, persisted, because the status quo. Uh, was never really put into question uh, the status quo in which the former imperial core, Russia, has a natural right to dominate fully its former periphery, for example, Ukraine in this case. And um, one of the dimensions of, of, of uh, Russian contemporary imperialism is that it's driven by this resentment of a fallen empire. And what is important, a uh, uh, it's driven by a project of a nas nationalizing empire that uh, considers people living in now independent states, Belarus and Ukraine, uh, that consider them as a part of their 
national community, national core of the empire. So to conclude, um, I think more attention should be paid to the history of, of uh, those communities that didn't have a voice because it was Russian imperial empire speaking on their behalf and imposing its narrative for for a long time and uh, especially uh, in the Soviet Union it was normalized uh, and the current war is probably one of these um, defining moments that calls us uh, for a deep reflection about the uh, conceptual um, and epistemic structures uh, underpinning our analysis so for me it's essential to call to call you to engage in a in a critical reflection on the narratives we produce as a community of thinkers and uh, political activists and um, because this pre precisely because these narratives have a tendency to be tacitly reproduced uh, in a wider social cultural imagination so thank you very much and uh, i hope we can have um, a discussion, we have time for it. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, indeed, we have some time for discussion, for questions and answers. So the way we are going to do it is that uh, we will make a selection of some of the questions that have been raised and then give you um, give the speakers time to respond and then we will see how much time we have left for maybe a second or a third round uh, of questions. So to start with, uh, there is a question um, by Thibaut Brichot, which is addressed uh, to Catherine. And the question is, could you please develop on the thesis that maintaining NATO was not mainly aimed at containing Russia, but in fact the result of the will of the US and UK to control a unified German. So that is the first question. I have another question, uh, which is especially, I think, for Hannah. Uh, and that concerns the situation in the so-called People's Republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. Um, from the beginning, a large part of Russian propaganda maintained the theme that the Russian invasion was in fact an operation to aid uh, the people in those areas and even to save them from a genocide that was being committed by the Ukrainian government. Uh, so I would like to ask you to address uh, the situation there and what impact the Russian war is, is having there as well. And Finally, a question by Daniel Prince, which I think can be addressed to both speakers. Um, you both spoke about the continuity of the Russian imperial project. Um, but it seems that this continuity survived uh, the October Revolution even. Um, so can you give your thoughts on how this kind of imperialism could survive the fall of the Tsar and all the social economic changes that were brought about after the October Revolution. So those are three questions. I suggest that Catherine uh, starts. Um, we will see how much time you need to develop your answers, but uh, we will give you a signal when it's time to to conclude. Okay, so okay, go ahead, the, Catherine. Okay, the question are, are very interesting. I propose to answer to the first question on uh, NATO and uh, Germany, then to leave uh, Anna answer to the second one, and then we will share the, the 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 last question. Not to speak too long, if you agree. So uh, I only for the moment uh, take the first question. Huh? So first remark, so but to be short, but it is a very important question. The German issue was first of all um, um, an issue for Soviet Union itself and for Gorbachev. Uh, Gorbachev, uh, I remind you that uh, 
he came uh, into ruling between uh, 1985 and the end of the 80s. And um, his uh, project was not at the beginning a capitalist transformation of uh, uh, Soviet Union, but uh, market reform and transformation, I don't go into the details, but the, the, the aim was to try and consolidate the economy of Russia after uh, the years of destruction and also uh, after the beginning of uh, the, 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 the new phase of Cold War, which was occurring uh, at the international level, uh, in, in the beginning of the 80s after Afghanistan uh, war uh, and which uh, was a burden for the, the Russian economy uh, for um, the concentration of its expenses on military issues. So Gorbachev orientation had both an internal perestroika uh, project of reforming which uh, in the beginning was not a generalized privatization, but kind of reform which existed in the 60s in Hungary or partially in Yugoslavia, let us say. It changed later on. But at that, the second dimension was the glasnost, that is to try and de debureaucratize the bureaucracy. But the internal dimension of Gorbachev line was to try to decrease what was presented as a burden for the Russian uh, uh, economy and burden. So this has two sides. One side was the concrete aid, uh, which was given by Soviet Union to uh, sister countries like Cuba, which of course was never neutral, always politically conditioned, but was still an aid. Uh, uh, but it was also, <laughs> The Soviet intervention, military intervention with the Vassal Pact against uh, social upsurge, anti-bureaucratic upsurge in 56, in 68, in Czechoslovakia. So uh, in order to receive uh, credits from Western countries for the priority of its internal reconstruction and perestroika, Gorbachev wanted to have an international line of the, um, uh, of, um, um, uh, how would you say, um, uh, change in uh, suppressing of any, uh, I'm uh, looking for the English term, but anyway, suppressing its own uh, intervention. So, and pacific coexistence, radical pacific coexistence with the capitalist system. And Germany was a key issue to receive credits, to withdraw the troops, uh, which were uh, Russian troops, which were in Germany, and to give credibility, there was a, an ongoing debate uh, about a German kind of unification, but which would be uh, under the so-called um, slogan of uh, European Common House, uh, which uh, Mitterrand tended to support. That was not a complete dissolution uh, of uh, the, the, the Eastern system, but the idea of a kind of a pacific coexistence and the solution of international pacts. Okay, so this issue, NATO and, and, and Vassal Pact were of course uh, important for Gorbachev also. Uh, the, the, the de facto unific uh, uh, German unification as, as it occurred, uh, was um, uh, accelerated by the decision to introduce one single currency, the Deutschmark, which was very attractive for Eastern European uh, people, of course, the uh, hypothesis and hope with the new um, real money, real existing uh, money, uh, the Deutschmark, uh, to have some possibility to uh, also uh, buy uh, very attractive, of course, uh, Western products and so on. So the monetary in unification was a decision which frightened, frightened uh, de facto both Margaret Thatcher and in the, the US dominant powers uh, because they had the narrative, I don't discuss this point, but they had the not only the narrative, but the memory, you see, of a strong Germany of the past, 
and they wanted to control this process. So, um, and so in front of this process of German unification, which was an absorption, you have very good articles in Le Monde Diplomatique uh, on that issue, uh, you, which have been translated in different languages. So, um, so the German unification was not a monet only a monetary unification, but an absorption of the Eastern European system and a privatization with a real existing uh, capital, uh, a capital in money capital uh, for accumulation and a very strong uh, bourgeois state, which didn't exist elsewhere. So the, the issue of NATO at that moment was discussed and many leftists say, okay, there was some promises um, not to go further than integration of the unified Germany within NATO. Okay, but the, the issue and the, the project was to control Germany uh, for the UK and for the uh, uh, United States in that NATO promising nothing clear for, for the next uh, period. That was concentrated on Germany and Gorbachev did accept that because it received with the acceptance of these uh, credits, the possibility to withdraw his troops and to try and concentrate on the transformation of its own uh, system. But then the international uh, 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 monetary, but also financial and political uh, dominant institution who were not accepting the kind of uh, transformation that Gorbachev wanted for Soviet Union. It was not an anti-Russian problem. It was a problem of transform destruction of a system, which even if I and many others like me don't consider as a socialist system, was an anti-capitalist system and uh, um, uh, out of uh, a revolution. And the, the aim to, not uh, anti-Russian, but to, to destroy what could be left from uh, the Soviet revolution was a real aim. And this was done not by NATO, but by Yeltsin, Yeltsin uh, <laughs> building of uh, uh, Russia, which was considered as a continuation of Soviet Union as far as its dimension, which in reality was not a, a Russian speaking uh, territory, but a, a real a multinational federation. So Russian so-called self-determination decided by Yeltsin, by the Ukrainian power and by Belarus power in 1991 was the end of Gorbachev power, the end of Soviet Union. And that was not because of NATO. Huh? That's, so I stop here um, and uh, I am only add one remark, even in the non-legal uh, war first and uh, legal war launched by NATO, against uh, uh, Yugoslavia Milosevic because of Kosovo issue in uh, 18, uh, 1981. Even that was not anti-Russian. Uh, Milosevic, uh, uh, what was, um, uh, I, I must say, if you go into the archives and see what was going on behind the scene, that NATO was uh, at the eve of a huge crisis and destruction so the fact to maintain it and to intervene in the war without any mandate from the United Nations was a big crisis. So to end the war against Milosevic, they had to reintroduce United Nations and the protectorate on Kosovo, which was not a NATO protectorate, but the European Union and United Nations protectorate with the signature of Milosevic and Russia. So I stop here to say that the story was not yet an anti-Russian issue. The question about the uh, so-called uh, republics of uh, Donetsk and Lugansk, which we know as, as the Donbas, uh, and the uh, Russian propaganda about uh, to justify the invasion in 2014, and now uh, the propaganda which um, claims the idea that the Russian-speaking population is threat uh, in these regions because they are uh, Russian-speaking uh, regions, as uh, most of the uh, eastern and southern part of Ukraine, like big cities, are, are Russian-speaking, and it's due to uh, 
the imperial history, the history of imperial um, domination, Russian domination over uh, over Ukraine. So they, you have Russified the, the, the cities which carry the imperial culture and the countryside which remained um, remained populated by the local local population with their local culture um, and uh, yeah so the um, it will be difficult to to give a very concentrated um, uh, explanation uh, about all this issue of uh, protecting pretending to protect the russian-speaking population uh, in the eastern part of ukraine uh, some things that uh, you need to to know is that uh, these are the very urbanized, very urbanized uh, region. That's why you have the majority of the Russian speaking population. It was uh, populated during the uh, 20th century by a very heterogeneous uh, uh, ethnic uh, groups, but it was the unifying culture was, was a Russian culture and the unifying language was a russian language and uh, actually it was kind of a wealthy it was a wealthy region because of its um, uh, industry um, so an idea uh, which is important to understand is that the uh, so-called uh, russian speaking so first of all you uh, russian speaking doesn't uh doesn't mean that these people are associating themselves with with russia in any way for example me i'm totally russian speaking and i learned ukrainian uh, in when i was adult um, and i i'm from donetsk but i didn't have uh, a russian identity and i was uh, not related in any way to the russian state i wasn't even visiting russia uh, when I was a child or, or even as, a, as an adult. Uh, so uh, there, there are Russian speaking uh, uh, speaking citizens, uh, especially the young generation, which doesn't identify them with a Russian uh, national project. Um, and the second uh, thing to understand is the so-called Russian speaking minority in the uh, post-Soviet republics, uh, non-Russian post-Soviet republics. Uh, these are not minority as we as as we as we understand it. These are they were a part of uh, imperial majority during the imperial times and the Soviet Union. So um, in a, in terms of um, uh, the fact that they were um, they carried the uh, uh, imperial language and culture which was the only way to uh, to succeed in life and to have to to be promoted in in a, in a professional sense and to be perceived as a as an equal to be perceived as a modern uh, soviet citizen for example is it, it, you have to be russian speaking so when the uh, soviet union uh, dislocated uh, so some uh, these people who were considering them as a part of a majority uh, suddenly became a minority within the state, within the nation that they were considering as uh, peasant, illiterate and not worthy of, uh, of you know, respect. Uh, so this was for, for some of the people who lost uh, during the 90s uh, the dignity of uh, workers' identity. Um, uh, you know, the economic condition was quite hard. Um, a way to uh, to um, to preserve dignity was to actually uh, uh, preserve this kind of uh, imperial ma majority uh, identity, and it was exploited by the Russian state with their conception of a Russian world when. Uh, um, they monopolize and uh, monopolized the notion of Russian culture and language, uh, considering that every Russian speaking uh, person in the world and especially in the neighboring countries are the potential citizens of Russia or uh, or the, the members, the members of their community without even asking them. Uh, so these are my comments uh, to understand what we're talking about and what what are the reasons of this propaganda and how it works? And no need to say that uh, this kind of thing, like uh, genocide or I don't know, it's 
uh, it's very, <laughs> it, it, yeah, I don't know how to formulate it, but um, it's the extreme propaganda. The Russian speaking community in Ukraine was not threatened like physical or something in the Russian language during the Ukrainian independence was de facto um, uh, a language and a culture that dominated in media and uh, it only changed after uh, the Russian aggression uh, started. Um, and about the continuity, I'm sorry to be long in, in, in giving my answers, about the continuity uh, of the imperial, I don't know, um, yeah, of the empire, which survived, survived the October Revolution. There is also many things to say, but um, I think one of the things um, which are which need to un to understand that, that the Russian Empire, also in its uh, Soviet modification, was um, uh, always uh, in a tension between the project of uh, cooptation of um, uh, of the elites elites um, of uh, dominated uh, populations. So the tension between the cooptation project and the forced assimilation project, like the uh, uh, tension between the imperial project and the uh, na nationalization, uh, na nationalizing project. So uh, when the Russian imperial elites had an impression, had a feeling of their, that their power and the power of their regime is fragile, uh, these were the moments when the Russian national project predominated over the project of the empire. It was the case in the 19th century after, for example, the Polish, the Polish uprisings and after the, um, uh, the uh, appearance, not appearance, after uh, uh, in a moment where the uh, uh, national movements of uh, dominated elites emerged. Uh, but there is also a dimension that we need to understand is that um, these uh, elites of uh, dominated nation were never fully, uh, fully assimilated into the imperial project because of the lack of the modernization and because of the lack of uh, willingness of imperial Russian imperial elites to invest in the modernization of their state, which means that the uh, project of, of a nationalizing uh, Russian state was uh, never has never been completed um, because there was a um, yeah the, the elites were so concentrated on the uh, preservation of their wealth and, and power uh, that uh, Russian um, uh, Russian uh, empire was never fully uh, modernized and in the Soviet times there is also was uh, a tension between this uh, cooptation and assimilation of uh, the non non Russian non Russian republics uh yeah uh well there uh, sorry for being long and uh, <laughs> for using my my bad english and um if there is any need to develop more on this on this issue um uh, we can we can try so thank you hannah i come back uh first to 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 comment um, uh, briefly, also uh, an issue that uh, Anna uh, raised and developed. So, uh, first brief comment uh, um, about what uh, Anna said, which is important uh, on the, the the evolution of the statue, uh, the, the the statue, the status of uh, uh, Russian-speaking minority after the collapse of the Soviet Union losing their dominant position and so on. Uh, I want only, only to add that uh, with the example of, uh, of Ukraine, but it could occur elsewhere, there was no fatal, like she said, by the way, that there was no fatal 
feelings, uh, uh, because um, and, and fatal uh, behavior, political choice, political choice. And there has been, like she also, also said, changing position. And for instance, uh, at the uh, moment of uh, the decision to destroy uh, Soviet Union uh, by the three components in 91, that is Russian, Bela Belarus, and Ukrainian leaders, uh, putting an end to the act of building the Soviet Union uh, in, uh, in 1922. Uh, at that moment, independent uh, nations, uh, independence was uh, something that many uh, people, whatever be their language, could feel as a process of democratization, which was not contradictory with the hope to maintain the social gains of the former system and, uh, and a form of union. That it is, was not necessarily uh, something which was considered as a split with no more relationship with the former, uh, for instance, uh, uh, countries uh, uh, for, uh, of Russia and so on. And in the referendum uh, that Anna referred to in 91, um, more than 90% of the population uh, in Ukraine participated to the, the referendum in all regions and in, in particular in Donbass. Huh? And everywhere, more than 80%, uh, much more than 80%, including in the Donbass, voted for independence. And even in Crimea, even in Crimea, where you have the, the Tatar population, which now is, um, which was 12%, and which had been repressed and expressed by Stalin and so on, and was attached to a Ukrainian uh, uh, framework. Uh, but um, there is also a Russian, a real Russian uh, citizen, part of the population which is Russian, but even there, the majority voted for independence. So Crimea uh, won, uh, after a negotiation and so on, a, a statute of uh, a specific statute within Ukraine, permitting a combination of uh, being part of Ukraine and a part of, uh, uh, of autonomy. So, and then, and uh, when you go up to the, the crisis in 2015 or so, to, to stress that point, before the, just before the crisis, if we speak of what was uh, dom dominating even Ukraine oligarch, uh, if I compare with Yugoslavia, where you had new bourgeoisie according to national split of the former Yugoslavia. But in Ukraine, uh, you, you had a, a, a more or less one third of international trade with the former Soviet Union, that is the, the countries coming of the la CEI, the international community, uh, uh, which was built in a very soft way after Soviet Union. So one third of the trade with that part of former Soviet Union, let us say, one third with European Union and one third with the rest of the world. And there was no uh, in, in, uh, in 2013 in Ukraine, there was no uh, strong uh, pressure and attempt to, to uh, even to join NATO and to join European Union. There was more the most, both in the population, of course, with different feelings according to the territory, but altogether there was more and hope uh, to combine links. Bon. And there, I must, I must say that that was another story. There, there was really a conflicting, antagonistic pressure on Ukraine after the big financial crisis of 2008, 2009, to have to choose to choose between European Union and criteria of IMF to deal with its debt or the pressure uh, through the gas issue from Russia. So this was a turning point, but in the feeling and expression of uh, the population, I, I support completely um, what uh, Anna has said, that even in the Russian speaking part of Ukraine, it is uh, an, uh, Putin aggression in that period and afterwards, and in the recent period that consolidate a kind, a, 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 a really popular uh, 
uh, support of uh, Ukraine, uh, the building of uh, Ukrainian uh, resistance, uh, whatever the language you speak. So that is very important. Then on, about continuity and discontinuity. Uh, um, first, uh, I must I must say that um, uh, two, two, two remarks. <laughs> Uh, first, about uh, from uh, the Tsarist past, uh, let's say the empire, Russian empire, uh, up to the post-Soviet, I, I would disagree personally. I am not an historian. I would not develop that point. But my uh, convictions and my what I know about uh, this history um, makes me um, uh, have uh, most doubt about the idea of only continuities. So I would combine in the analysis element of continuities, but not in a linear way, with a strong element of discontinuities. Uh, that is, even the form of domination uh, could change. Bon. And uh, by the way, what was even said by Putin in his narrative as uh, Anna uh, reminded us and so on uh, about Lenin's choice shows discontinuities at that moment. But it was an unstable and discontinuities. You can look at uh, Eric Toussaint work on the debt issue or so, or so on. So, so the, 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 there was a very strong political anti-Tsarist, anti-Great uh, Russian policy which was uh, supported uh, by a part, at least, of the leading forces of the Bolshevik, Lenin, Trotsky among them, even if that was not clear since the beginning. They changed their mind, there was an evolution, and there was a conflicting uh, dimension between, on one hand, the uh, anti-Tsarist, anti-capitalist, anti, -tsarist, anti um, uh, empire and great Russian empire, political actions and uh, mobilizations of the Bolshevik and of the Russian, uh, of the Russian uh, Revolution, and the very um, uh, confused, uh, um, confused, not clear-cut project of how to build the new society, uh, how to organize pl planning system, with redistribution, industrialization of non-industrialized part and so on. How do you reduce the gaps? That was also an issue for uh, Yugoslavia and so on. How would you combine in a pro-communist, pro-socialist project in a dynamic way, uh, anti-capitalist standpoint against the relationship of domination which was inherited of, from the past huh? and the socio-economical attempt to unify the proletariat of, of, of all nations, to organize the planning system in a re redistributive way, which meant a kind of centralist state and so on. And there was not enough, not, it was normal in the context of the period, uh, experience and thinking about the issues uh, of uh, the building of a socialist society. Rosa Luxembourg criticized very sharply Lenin and Trotsky about a certain aspect of their policy. But then the historical trend led to the crystallization of the Stalinist power. And, and then in Stalin, like in Putin, he used elements of continuities in the discontinuity of the new system. I would not call it uh, on myself a, a kind of a, a capit capitalist imperialist, but there was a real colonial, neo-colonial form inside of the Stalinist uh, poli policy. So I cannot develop this, but you should read what has been written uh, by Zbigniew Kowalewski and published, for instance, in Imprecor IVP, International Viewpoint, uh, about those issues, uh, which is not uh, also something which is not to be debated. It's a, a process of elaboration. I am not competent as an historian uh, to, to deal with this. I am, uh, but I, I do believe there was this combination of non-linear history and new forms of oppression. I have written, if you want to, to, to have a look at it, I don't develop that, 
uh, an article you can find both on my website or on the website of Europe Solidaire Sans Frontières, Europe Solidaire Without Frontier, uh, which uh, was at the moment of the Ukrainian crisis of 2014, compar comparing well about the debate on what is to be what means to be uh, anti-imperialist in the context of the Yugoslav and of the Ukrainian wars, and like the war was beginning at that time. And I said there's a, a debate about concept, but it is not because it is not a capitalist imperialism uh, that Soviet Union, uh, the Stalinist Soviet Union was better. Yeah? It was a very oppressive, dramatic uh, uh, oppression which could be uh, killing peoples, expulsing complete uh, uh, co co populations like the Tatar, for instance, and so on. And with the uh, Ukraine, the, the use of uh, uh, agriculture issue against the Ukrainian peasants and so on as uh, an identification of any kind of Ukrainian um, resistance uh, as anti-Soviet, anti-workers and anti-progressive uh, 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 statement, as Nazi even and so on. So this is a very confused issue. So it is not because it is not a capitalist imperialism that the Stalinist Soviet Union was better. So I, I, I say, and I finish on that point, when we analyze continuity, discontinuity, and what could be the best concept to the to, to, to describe this, like uh, Anna proposes us to work on. It is a process of work that we have to mutualize. But I would say behind the conceptual uh, dimensions, analyze the concrete uh, relationship of domination in all its dimension. And uh, uh, without minimizing those who, which pretend to be anti-capitalist, uh, it is not enough to be anti-capitalist to suppress oppression national oppression, women's oppression, and class oppression. So uh, it's very important for uh, communist and, and, and socialist updating uh, to have a decolonized approach of Marxism, of the, uh, of the past uh, revolutions, and uh, of our uh, uh, process uh, without um, the idea um, that there is a complete uh, simply uh, continuity, but without the minimizing the negative oppressive uh, dimension of the Soviet past. That is what I want to, to, to say. I stop here. S sorry to have been long. Thank you, Catherine. We have a few more, a couple of more questions addressed uh, to Hannah. So a first question is that many times in all kinds of propaganda, so-called extreme right-wing or ultra-nationalist groups are being pointed towards as proof that supposedly the Ukraine is uh, Nazi or fascist. Um, how should we answer that kind of propaganda? And that's a question from Wim Balthasar. And another question from Sarah Yavadi is about the anti-imperialist left inside Ukraine. Um, how were Zelensky's policies and anti-worker policies and how was the situation of the anti-imperialist left opposition to his policies before the war? And I guess also uh, the current situation. So, if you could reply to those two questions, Hannah, please. Yes, I will reply to those two questions. And if if it's okay, I will also uh, come back to the to the question about the continuous and discontinuous on, in the in the imperial uh, history of uh, Russia and Soviet Union. That um, it, it's very clear and uh, the. Um, a discourse of Putin shows us very clearly what are the continuous and what are the discontinuous of, of this story. And for him, uh, uh, the period, uh, the Lenin's period, the period of, of, of revolution, uh, civil war and the 20s uh, 
uh, it's a discontinuity with uh, a, a Russian history perceived as a continuous uh, glory of uh, a state uh, of an imperial uh, glory of, of a Russian state. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, even if um, uh, the early Bolshevik uh, project was a, cha a challenge to this uh, a project of a Russian nas nationalizing empire, uh, it was uh, very temporary and still even this in, in, in their, in their uh, project, um, the minorities, uh, the non-Russian non minorities uh, would still uh, come to be seen within a context. So the minorities were perceived still in the context of a civilizational project, of an imperial civilizational project. Of course, this civilizational project was radically secular, modern, uh, anti-imperialist, anti anti-chauvinistic, Russian chauvinistic, but it's still this um, uh, civilizational project implied a development, a, a hierarchy, hierarchization, I'm sorry, um, of, of like managing and shaping uh, minorities of the empire for the purposes uh, of this uh, civilizational project. Uh, so even um, like it, it was, uh, it it was, um, in, it has enabled in some way an imposition of of this civilizing project on often unwilling uh, subjects of the empire, both on in the west and in the east, and this liminary position between the uh west and east it's also something which is a, a strong continuity which and and the influence of this this liminary position we can see it in the policies adopted both by the um, some policies uh, adopted both by the uh, russian imperial elites by the soviet uh, elites and by the present russian political um, elites. So sorry for being on about the right wing in in Ukraine uh, and how to to explain uh, if they have any influence on the uh, Ukrainian politics. So the first thing is that uh, of course in the Ukraine in Ukraine there is an extreme uh, right wing groups like in every country of Europe, unfortunately. And um, with the uh, beginning of the war in 2014, and uh, with the fact that the war was long, and with the fact that these were the groups who have a previous experience of uh, using um, effective use of, effective use use of violence, they were in the avant garde of uh, of uh, military response of the Ukrainian state to the Russian invasion. So their participation in the Ukrainian um, in the first efforts of the Ukrainian uh, state to protect itself from the Russian invasion uh, legitimized their uh, position and ideology uh, in the inside of the Ukrainian population, legitimized them as the protectors, uh, etc. But at the same time, uh, as for the institutional politics, their right-wing groups um, after 2014 never received more than like 2% during the parliamentary elections. And there was no, um, I think, meaningful, like known candidates who, who was really supported by the population candidates, presidential candidates who were of uh, extreme right. So they are not present in, in, the, in the parliament, but they are present on the streets and their groups are kind of cooptated by the some oligarchic elites uh, inside of Ukraine. Uh, but it is less and less the case uh, after the Delensky was elected. Uh, so what showed us actually that even after six years of war, six years of invasion by the ex colonial power, Ukrainians were still 
not as nationalist as, as we tend to present them here because they elected a president that have um, an explicit program of a civic nation like his slogan was like east and west together it doesn't matter what language do we speak we need to unite the country uh, i i'm not saying it's he's he was uh, honest, completely honest in that, but this was his electoral program and his discourse and himself, he's a Russian speaking, uh, he do doesn't speak Ukrainian very well and uh, he's a Jew and he uh, kind of fits actually the stereotypes of the Jew in the um, uh, in the post-Soviet, you know, in the post-Soviet imagination. Uh, uh, Zelensky perfectly fits this uh, this uh, this stereotype, and uh, in this case, Ukrainians voted for him with an overwhelming, like uh, a very big number. Like no no president before has received such a, a strong amount of of um, how to say of, of yeah of legitimacy uh, from from his his voters. And the last thing to say about this right wing story uh, is. And that we tend to actually um, use this argument. People use this argument when they are trying to search for reasons not to support Ukraine, like they are, um, don't want to support it and they're trying to search for reasons for that. Uh, so there is also a position, uh, some kind of um, vision uh, which precedes that, but um, the fact that, that to, there is an idea that a, a desire, an idea that, that we could support Ukraine um, in in a case if it's perfect, like if it's a perfect revolutionary feminist eco-socialist society, very progressive, uh, like more progressive than any society in Europe, by the way, which votes for extreme right can candidates, like millions of people votes for them. But yeah, let's not talk about it. But there is like, uh, we can support Ukrainians if they uh, they are perfect, but we don't have such kind of demands, for example, for Palestinians or for other oppressed nations, which in 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 the process of fighting with 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 an imperialist um, force become more national more nationalist. But we don't uh, we we don't have this de demand of, of 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 being perfect. But for Ukrainians, we have. And about the labor, yeah, the the. Uh, um ukrainian left and its position towards the neoliberal policy of zelensky of course it has a very critical position towards zelensky government this is not our friend uh, like and we were fighting before the war and they were fighting before the war and especially after the war with all the uh, uh new uh, labor laws which annihilate uh, the, the the rights of workers during uh, during the war and Ukrainian leftists are very active in it and you can see the website of um, organization called social Ruch, social movement in Ukrainian where they explain what are they doing concretely how they are collaborating with uh, with uh, trade unions and uh, civic movements to yeah to to uh, to protest to protest these measures but i'm not currently in ukraine and i'm not involved on the ground with this kind of thing so i can and i already took a lot of time so uh, just go to their website and you will have the answers or maybe katrin can say something about that because I would. Uh, I think we have to finish. So I would only propose uh, to all, all all person who are attending this discussion to go to the and see the website of the European Network Solidarity Ukraine, where you can find both links with Social Ruch, that is the left in Ukraine with which we try to collaborate, and also Russian pacifists. But also you can find campaigns on feminist issue, on laws that Anna has described, and the fact that also our comrades were opposing the, 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 the law, uh, uh, repressing left ideas uh, 
uh, even those of the communist former po communist party when they disagree when our common disagree with them but the the fight for, of our common was for the political freedoms of expression against the decommunization kind of, of law and you can find on the website also uh, place for debates, open debates for analysis that we need to collectivize, to mutualize at the world level against what is the world imperialist system today and how to defeat it. So I'm sorry, I stop here. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Hannah, for your contributions. So that brings us to the end of today's uh, webinar. Tomorrow we will have the final day in this series. So tomorrow we will discuss specifically um, the Russian situation and Russian imperialism. Um, if you want to find out more information or find out links to books and articles, um, you can also check out the links on our website in the announcements uh, for today where you will, for example, find links to articles written by the speakers of today and to the European Network for Solidarity with Ukraine. Thank you for your participation. Uh, you can find more links on the IRE website. And tomorrow we will discuss in our final day the situation in Russia. Uh, that is the end of today. And we hope to see you all again tomorrow. Bye.